Welcome to our online event, Zoom In with Ed Hume, our Dirty Love Affair with Trash. Um, this webinar is hosted by the Natural Resources Council of Maine, which is the Maine's largest environmental advocacy organization. Um, I'm Kristen, our digital outreach manager, and I'm pleased to introduce our two speakers today. Um, but first, I'll just go over a couple of quick housekeeping items. Um, so we will have time for question and answer at the end of the webinar. If you submitted your question when you registered, we have that and we hope to get to it. Um, you can also drop your question in either the question and answer box that's down at the bottom of your Zoom screen or in the chat that you all are using. Um, we also have closed captioning available for the event. If you so need it, you can turn that on down at the bottom of your Zoom screen as well. Um, you just click show subtitles and it'll show you the transcripts. Um, and then finally, we will be putting this event on our YouTube channel if there's anything you want to revisit, and we'll be sending that out to you um, tomorrow via email. Um, but now onto our speakers. Um, first, we have Ed Humes. Ed is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and author of 16 nonfiction books, including Garbology, Our Dirty Love Affair with Trash, which he will be talking about today and is now working on a sequel to. Um, and then second, we have Sarah Nichols, who's NRCM Sustainable Maine Director. Um, and Sarah is a leading waste policy expert and was instrumental in passing the first in the nation extended producer responsibility for packaging law here in Maine. Um, so we'll hear a lot more about those two in a little bit. Um, but without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Ed, to pick things up. Great. Um, thank you so much, Kristen, and good morning, everyone. It's, um, well, it's morning here in California. Uh, so uh, if, if you haven't read Garbology, um, the key to what it's about is the subtitle, Our Dirty Love Affair with Trash. Um, because waste is the, the biggest thing we make in life. It's, it's part of virtually everything we do and buy and wear each day. And when we're gone, it's the biggest thing we leave behind. And like any other toxic relationship, we can't see its faults clearly, at least until a friend takes you aside, shakes you and says, wake up and smell the coffee. This relationship is killing you. Um, and that's what I wanted garbology to serve as a sort of a little bit of a, you know, shake you and make you see some things you're missing. Except in this case, our toxic affair with waste is also uh, killing the planet. Uh, as well as ourselves. But um, the flip side of the story, the other takeaway I hoped uh, to convey is that it's never too late to try and fix it. And that uh, waste, it turns out, is the one big environmental and economic crisis that anyone uh, can do something meaningful about, whether it's in the home, at the community level, um, in the state level. I'm happy to say that that's happening in Maine. Um, and maybe someday at the at the national level, uh, though I'm not really holding my breath on that one right now. Um, so uh, maybe I'd leave to hear that this is a, a book of stories, not lots of finger wags and scolds. And um, I thought I'd start by sharing uh, a story from the beginning of the book where you meet um, a family uh, named the Gastons of Chicago. And I'm gonna just uh, bring up a slide in a second to show you them, but they're a lovely couple. Um, but as they grew old and infirm, they began accumulating uh, their stuff until their home looked like, can you see, look like this. They are the Gaspins. Um, and they just couldn't get rid of anything. They became hoarders in their later years and the trash piled up to the point where they were trapped in their own home by their waste and rescued by concerned neighbors uh, near death. They were found buried alive uh, beneath their own waste. Um, so you may ask what, uh, uh, what can we learn from this kind of hoarding, this, this unusual uh, aberrant behavior? Because of course, normal people couldn't accumulate so much waste, could they? Uh, but the answer is we all could and we all do because it turns out the amount of junk and trash and waste that hoarders like the Gastons generated and, and sequestered in every part of their home uh, is perfectly normal. It's just that most of us hoard it in uh, landfills instead of our living rooms. Um, but the two years it took the Gastons to accumulate the five to six tons of trash that were removed from their home after they were rescued is absolutely typical of 
the average American couple. This is what this is what we all look like. Uh, we're just better at hiding it. Um, so uh, I'll give you another slide. The average American weighs 7.1 pounds of trash a day. And this has not really changed since garbology uh, uh, came out by, uh, uh, by very much. Uh, it adds up to uh, 1.3 tons a year or across the average lifetime, 102 tons of stuff that we throw away. And by the way, this, is, this data is not the sort of rosier and incorrect data that the EPA publishes every year. Um, uh, this is actual data from the nation's landfills. And I can elaborate on why our official numbers get this wrong uh, later, if you like, during the Q&A. So 102 tons, well, it's such a big number, it's not really meaningful to us, it's hard to visualize. So one of the things I like to do is help readers picture what that looks like. So think about it this way, when we die, each of us gets one grave. Um, we would need 1100 to hold our trash, uh, hold that 102 ton uh, a lifetime legacy. Basically, we need a cemetery of peace if we were going to, you know, sort of be uh, like the Egyptians and take our uh, ancient Egyptians and take our, our, our stuff with us at the end. Um, we need a lot of room. Now, I want to meet, uh, introduce you to the uh, one of the other major characters in the book, real quickly. Uh, I spent a lot of time with this character. It is, at the time, it was the largest active landfill in. Uh, America, I call the Garbage Mountain. Its official name uh, is the Puente Hills Sanitary Landfill. 60 years of LA waste, 130 million tons, 500 feet high. It's actually the uh, 12th tallest structure in Los Angeles, still is. Um, amazing place. I probably like to live there when the folks who, uh, who work it. Um, now, the cool thing about this, this 60 years worth of trash, this geologic feature that we've created of waste, uh, annually we make, as a nation, three garbage mountains every year. Um, three, well, it was at the time that it was published, it's now more, uh, 389 million tons of trash um, a year. And how much is that? Well, again, I tried to find a comparison that would begin to help us grasp that, but uh, that annual trash load weighs approximately as much as every car made in Detroit since World War II. Uh, all that Detroit iron. Um, so uh, let me get rid of these slides now. Uh, I like that. I like that. Uh, it helps me picture it anyway. Uh, the premise of the book is that we are the trashiest people on earth. We just don't know it. Uh, we're really good at hiding it from ourselves and also for, uh, good at ignoring the consequences for people and planet of, of our wasteful choices. Um, there's a lot more there's a storyline, many more characters in the book, but I just want to mention one more here. Um, uh, this, which is uh, the, the idea that we are in a seemingly endless struggle to raise what is a really quite pitiful national recycling rate that we, you know, after all these years, we're still really bad at it. And I argue the reason for that is that we're, we've made a mistake by uh, making uh, recycling our first line of defense against. Uh, against waste, against trash, uh, when in fact it should be the last resort. Uh, our first line of defense, uh, which we generally only have, have been giving lip service to, or certainly when I wrote Garbology 1, that's all it was, was lip service, are the other four R's. And I'm adding an R there, but it's reuse, reduce, refuse, and redesign. All those things are much better strategies for dealing with waste. Uh, and recycling is important. It's one of a vital R, but it should come after we've exhausted those first fours because a recycling alone is not going to get us out of this mess. That's the central premise of the book. Um, so uh, what's happened since publication of Garbology? It's been a few years. Uh, a lot has changed, but there's been one enormous earthquake of a change, and it can be summed up in one word, China. Um, China figured prominently in Garbology 1 because our trash was, at that time, our biggest export. At the time, um, China was our biggest customer and they paid top dollar for our stuff that nobody here wanted to deal with. Um, and, you, you know, it's a familiar story now, but it's worth mentioning in 2018, they said they don't want our crap anymore. And our recycling system, which had been hollowed out by dependence on, on um, China uh, taking all our stuff and paying for it, just collapsed. Uh, and, and in many ways, it was 
re revealed as a kind of sham, a uh, con game we were pulling on ourselves because half of what we put in the blue bin was not going to local recycling center. It was being loaded into otherwise empty containers being shipped back to China and, uh, and sent where only some of it was recycled and the rest of it just became pollution. Um, and we're still recovering from that big lie and trying to, you know, uh, rebuild uh, a, a system that uh, had fallen apart and was allowed to decay because of, of this inordinate system of exports. And uh, it was also a wake up call as well as a revelation and a wake up to the fact that what we were doing hasn't been working and, and never really had been or not for many years. And that brings us to the reason I'm working on a new garbology. I don't have the title exact, but I'm calling it garbology too for now. I'm gonna come up with something better. And this is not a story anymore about uh, seeing our waste clearly. It's about the way back from waste. Um, and I'm gathering stories of urban and rural communities, campus, sometimes whole states, happy to say Maine is one of them, that uh, have moved from the question, what can we do about this, to actually doing something and something meaningful. And I found some really, truly inspiring narratives for this new book. And I think um, uh, things that the rest of us can learn from and, and embrace as, as a way back from waste. And that certainly includes Maine's historic extended producer responsibility law, which is finally going to make the recycling system make sense and, and to work. And it's going to spread because it's so sensible and so right. Uh, if you make a wasteful product, you have two choices, pay to clean up your mess or design a product that isn't so wasteful in the first place. And it's the perfect carrot and stick. It goes beyond just recycling as a strategy. It encourages the end to our one and done disposable uh, economy. Uh, and it's, it's a truly a path to a circular economy. And once you start applying it more widely than just packaging and containers and, and Maine's first step is showing us the way. And that's why uh, I'm thinking seriously about starting the, the story right here in, in the beautiful state of Maine where so many good things <clears throat> are happening right now. So with that, I'll turn things over to the person and the organization who helped make that part of the story happen, Sarah Nichols. Great, thank you so much, Ed. I'm just so honored that you were able to join us today. Um, I just jotted down a million notes. I hardly know where to start. <laughs> um, oh no. <laughs> I know, Ed and I always have really good conversations and I'm glad that you are all joining us um, <laughs> for this one. Um, I am just happy to see so many familiar um, names on the list here. I know we're among good company. These are the, the movers and shakers in Maine who care just as deeply about this issue as we do. So thank everybody for coming. Um, I guess, uh, you know, the, the first thing that struck me when you began talking, Ed, was that the, um, the anthropological aspect to our waste, that's exactly how I think about it too. And everybody back when we used to go to parties, now we're starting to do that more. Everybody has some sort of story or a relationship or something to tell about their trash when I tell them what I do for work. So I just feel like it's very personal for people, you know, even you go, you know, the uh, law enforcement, um, if there's, a, you know, they can look in your trash and tell a lot about a person kind of thing, oh, yeah. you know, it's, it's just, I think, find it fascinating. Um, and um, again, what you said about our toxic relationship, I've been kind of harping on this for a while and trying to make analogies because uh, that's a good way to just change the way people think about this issue. Um, even another connection to mental health, like the think, feel, act cycle. Like, I think it's super important to just change how we, we think about our waste and think about who's responsible for it um, and how to change it because that's really what the, um, you know, tying in the corporations who are producing all of this garbage. That's That was really the first step in getting the extended producer responsibility law was getting decision makers and municipalities and people to understand that, wait a minute, it's actually not our necessarily our responsibility to clean up this mess, this onslaught of waste that's coming at us. We need to look up to where it's coming from and getting that switch in people's mind was you know easier than i thought actually <laughs> um but uh like you said it makes so much sense um and i always use the example which many of you probably heard about my my kids because uh i have five and eight year old boys and they're messy and um you know if i expect them to clean up their own mess they make less mess in the first place so you know if they leave it for mom to clean up then the house is a complete disaster because they can just not have anything to do with it 
Um, they don't always listen, but it generally works. <laughs> um, so it's the same kind of idea. Um, and um, another thing that you said, which I totally agree with, is this um, notion of recycling being um, misplaced as number one strategy to combat our waste problem. Um, you know, if you look at our our shoddy data over the <laughs> over the many decades we've been recording the data, you know, it's great. The recycling rate seems to be going up, but the pie is growing and growing and growing. So we're not really making as much progress as we'd like to think we're making. So um, we really need to focus on stopping that pie from growing and shrinking it while also increasing the amount that's recycled, if you can envision that pie chart like that. Um, and with, as far as, you know, focusing next, um, that's a huge part of the EPR for packaging law is finding more ways to um, incorporate waste reduction and reuse and redesign and all of those things into the, to the system. Um, but, you know, when the, when China, um, you know, had the, the green sword and that huge wake up call to everybody that really expedited the need for policies like this. So I was almost, oh, yeah. um, and, and, and campaigning on that policy as a way to help recycling was the, the, the way in, because that's what people know people want to do. Um, so we called it recycling reform here. It completely is. It's a whole new system of approaching things. Um, but there's really a lot more, more to it, um, than that. And we're going to be focusing on that, um, you know, going into the rulemaking and the, the details of this program for the next few years. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, it's funny you mentioned, uh, you know, the recycling stat. So uh, since you brought that up, I'll, I'll, I'll explain why I use different data. So I was able to get from um, Columbia University and uh, uh, the um, uh, bio journal, I think it was called, did this joint project where they were actually measuring, take gathering the data from the nation's landfills uh, going state by state and actually measuring it. The EPA has never done that or never used that data. They just have these models that they uh, use based upon uh, buying patterns and data from retailers and they look at the life cycle and expected life expectancy of products and they cook all that up and come out with a model which they devised first devised in the 70s before we had good data from landfills to calculate how much trash we were making. And it made sense back then. It makes absolutely no sense to use that model now uh, um, uh, because it's it, it's not accurate. And we have back, <laughs> they could be accessing accurate data every year. Uh, so I just, I used the real numbers and it showed our national recycling rate at the time garbology came out wasn't 30, in the low 30%, it was 25%. Um, and even that, uh, whatever, we've only seen from the national level EPA data for up through the year 2018 before China. Uh, and we were counting all that stuff we were loading on ships going abroad as, as part of what we were recycling. So who knows what the new data is going to show. I suspect it's already, we're going to see a plunge in the proportion that's been recycled in our waste, even as the waste continues to go up. So there's a mm -hmm. the, the full fallout of that earthquake in the system is is only now it hasn't really been observed in those national stats yet mm -hmm. uh, it frustrates me because the media this national media uses those epa statistics which if you corner them they admit well they're not right yeah that's what we do uh, no you're um yeah you're completely right the um we have such poor um data collection in in maine too and even each town um you know they they have a voluntary reporting system right now to the state um, and it's and they'd all report things differently and we don't really know what the denominator is we don't know how much waste is coming into the state and this is the unsung hero in my mind of the epr law because we are going to get so much juicy data and um yeah. you know there's even you know we'll know what's coming in because producers of the packaging will have to report how much and of what type of material they're selling into the state um, so, that, so that they can pay the fees to the stewardship organization and municipalities will have to report what they're doing so that they can get reimbursed. So there's a huge incentive to report those numbers. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, there's something in the law um, that defines at what point you can consider, can, can consider something recycled. 
um, basically it has to be put into a new <laughs> product and we can track that as best as we possibly can. Um, but it's not just what's collected at the curb, it's what's taken and then sent on to actually be recycled. No, no more wish cycling, huh? Is that the... Uh... Yeah. And um, so that is going to, I think that's going to significantly drop our recycling rate, but I think that's fine. We need not lie to ourselves about how good we're doing to make ourselves feel good. We need to know just how bad it is so that people are more compelled to act. So that's lawmakers, businesses, people, everybody. Um, so I just want to get some transparency and truth and um, in Maine and in elsewhere now that uh, there's four states now with um, the EPR for packaging laws on the books and they're all being implemented real quick. It's Oregon, uh, Colorado, and California. Um, but there's a real fight over who controls um, the stewardship organization and the system. And to me, I think they want control of the data. So I think the corporations want to be able to say that what they're selling is recyclable. See, because we've just defined it as recyclable. And look, it's doing all these great things. Don't look too close at the fine print and we'll control what numbers we release to you. I think it's I think it's less of a fight over the cost because it's not that much compared to what a lot of these companies are making. It's a tiny little, teeny little bit. Um, but I think they want control over the narrative and they want control over the data. So in Maine, we have a system where they're not going to have that control. And I'm really proud of that. Yes, and they do not like that part of it, as I recall from the uh, from the uh, testimony and the, uh, the lead up to the passage of that. And, and it's, uh, well, I think Maine is taking the, the only logical approach it, we can't i don't think it, you can blame um corporations for taking the path that is going to do what their central mission is which is to you know increase shareholder value that's that's what they exist for and without laws like epr there's there's no motivation for the kind of change that the and innovations that we need to to get a handle on our 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 waste problem and uh you know maine is making the bigger opportunity for these companies on the side of less waste by adopting this practice and maintaining stewardship over the process um uh, that's really the only sensible <laughs> way to go the example i like to use used uh, when i first when the book came out and i wanted to have a good example about what's wrong with the system that sort of leaves it up to the markets you get junk mail you know i mean we're literally with an art artificially low postage rate where taxpayers are subsidizing the junk mail we all hate and and it's a huge waste problem at, at the time i was collecting this data about one one percent of the contents of the uh, average landfill or material going into landfills was junk mail you know i mean it's, it's a colossal amount of material that was being thrown away and and we it's still a plague even though some of it's been reduced by different steps we can take but it's just a nutty system to be subsidizing a wasteful product that nobody absolutely nobody actually wants mm -hmm. um and uh, uh our system is riddled with those kinds of hidden subsidies because the there's no real regulation there's no guidance but from um, uh, in the law to 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 guide free enterprise into also serving the public good and and that's what your law is doing um and it's ultimately going to increase prosperity because it's waste is ultimately a cost it's always a cost and it's just the question is who's going to bear that cost well I, it's only just that the people who are the source of the problem are assuming responsibility uh for those rather than taxpayers subsidizing the waste and that's that's the brilliance of your epr law and you just don't put the, <laughs> the foxes in charge of the chicken coop you just don't <laughs> every farmer knows that right and uh and and that's that's what maine's approach is avoiding Mm -hmm. Yeah, couldn't have said it better myself. But <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, well, I see. Um, see, Jackie had a question about advanced recycling um, that's going through, throughout the country, and that's related a little bit to, um, you know, the fiberite facility, which is now called it was called Coastal Resources, and now I forget the new name they're calling it. But it's a mixed waste processing facility where they're going to. Is that anaerobic uh, digestion? Is that? 
Um, they're using some anaerobic digestion. Well, right now it's not open. It's a defunct closed facility, but they're trying to get it back online. But part of what they're calling recycling there is making plastic briquettes and burning that for fuel, which is essentially one of these advanced recycling techniques that Jackie's asked about in the in the chat here. And I know some people um, had questions about that facility. And um, I think maybe, Ed, I'll just ask you um, your thoughts on this so-called um, advanced recycling that a lot of plastics and packaging manufacturers are trying to pursue um, and whether or not, um, yeah, uh, that's recycling in your, um, <laughs> how do we define recycling? Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, um, I think let's put this in the sort of category of waste to energy in general. I think that's fair. Right. And that's not recycling. It is, it is the opposite of recycling. Um, they were, uh, uh, I, I talk about this big plan in the um, 90s in Los Angeles and the first garbology to build these giant um, waste to energy plants in order to curtail landfilling and what we weren't recycling, which is going to be fed into the mall of these, uh, these plants. And of course, they were all located uh, in, in the most underserved and, and uh, uh, impoverished parts of Los Angeles, where the constituency didn't have the cloud of uh, of more affluent cities that could say, hey, no way I'm in our backyard. Um, the, these these plans were ultimately uh, too unpopular to, to get by and were, uh, were, were scrapped after a, a long battle and several lost elections and propositions. So um, it's, it's another one of those last resort. To, trash is a terrible fuel. It's it's an energy loser. You get so much little out of what you put into it, and and this is just another uh, you know putting a new new shine on the same old uh, tarnished penny. As far as I'm concerned, it's there's a place for it, but only you know designing products that are genuinely recyclable and infinitely recyclable. And we do have materials that are. I mean, the aluminum can. It's a perfect uh, case for a, a product that uh, can be recycled infinitely without losing any of its integrity. It's an element, it can't break down any more than that. Uh, it, it is less energy, less water, massively less expense to reuse aluminum rather than getting virgin aluminum. So that should be the model of when we think about recyclability. And, and we're even bad at recycling that. I think we only recover about 65% of our aluminum, even though it's, you know, it generally retains its value. Uh, we're just really bad at it. But that is, that should be the standard against we measure all other supposedly recyclable products and materials and, and go from there. I'm not saying we make everything out of aluminum. I'm saying when we design uh, plastics and polymers that they should either be reusable or uh, redesigned so that they can be refashioned into 100% uh, recycled material. But that can be done uh, if if the right incentive is, if that's where the opportunity lies for 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 profit and innovation, um, that's where they'll go. But the, if if they can make little bricks. Uh, out of it and get it, you know, 10% return on the energy invested in creating the product in the first place. They'll do that because it's cheap and easy. Um, but I don't, I don't see that as a, anything but a solution on the margins. Mm -hmm. That's my take. Again, great storyteller. You say things better than I would say. Um, <laughs> um, but just like your, yeah, I think you're right. The, um, planning at the beginning. So like to the, to the what sustainability is, it's just, planning for the future <laughs> I don't that's like to me the simplest way to or just planning things um in a way it's like system it's a systems way of thinking to me sustainability and um so I'm really weary of this um advanced recycling um I, I clump it in with um this just greenwashing in general um I'm you know just the term they're co-opting the term recycling which people associate with the right thing to do and um, trying to influence um, people and policymakers that it's the right thing. So when this mixed waste processing plant um, in Hamden 
I'm just going to keep calling it fiber, right? Because that was the original technology and I don't know what they're calling it now. But, um, you know, they were really selling that to Maine's communities as this environmental solution and the right thing to do for the environment. And um, I was flabbergasted when our Department of Environmental Protection approved their permitting for this because there was a million reasons not to, including the financial and technical viability of it, which has proven to be right? They, they're not viable right now. Um, but I was really upset that um, that they had a well-oiled advocacy machine and they were able to sell this on its environmental merits. And um, uh, yeah, we weren't able to prevent, um, prevent it from going forward. And now um, this facility is still, it's owned um, by uh, an organization that represents municipalities that send their waste there. And um, they're going to have to something figure out what to do with it basically and um you know it's already built and it's there um but to me you know it's right in up, right in there with waste to energy where you need a certain amount of trash to feed these like i call them hungry trash monsters um so <laughs> you know they need to be fed so just by design any waste reduction or pulling waste from that stream is not good for their business and it's not you they can't even function if they don't have enough waste so um you know, I say, like making the best out of what we have now. I think we should have keep the ones that we have now, but we certainly don't need to be building any new ones. And I'm really just upset that this even um, was built here. And we'll, yeah, we'll see what happens. It's a it's a bad incentive in terms of you invest in this infrastructure, and then like you say, you have to feed the feed the monster. And that's that's the opposite of the kind of incentive we we really want to have in place. Um, and and you know, I, I want to say a little thing about. Um, when I was writing garbology, particularly all these cities were having these zero waste goals and we're going to recycle everything and no more landfilling. And, and there's a place for landfills and, and we need them uh, now. The reality is uh, some things are better off landfilled than recycled because uh, the climate impact of recycling them is, um, is so much greater than just sequestering them in a safe, well-run sanitary landfill. Um, and so I don't, I don't want to give the impression that uh, people who are really thinking about the way forward are saying we can't have landfills. That's, that's that for the foreseeable future, they're part of, of the solution. And um, until we have things that are genuinely recyclable, I don't think we should ignore that as, as, a, mm -hmm. as part of the solution. Uh, I kind of hate to say that, but it's, it's, no, it's, it's I, real. I mean, it's facing reality. Yeah, um, no, I, and I, I, I like, it's a, I like to say one life cycle example, you know, those uh, ubiquitous composite light plastic padded envelopes that Amazon sells things and sends all over to creation. Um, you can buy tuna in pouches made out of the same things. Um, those are not recyclable. Uh, but they they are so environmentally benign in terms of their manufacture uh, and their afterlife in a, in a landfill that if you compare to that the the carbon footprint of recycling a tuna can or uh, using heavier cardboard than these little pouches um, the recyclable option for products like that is actually worse for our planet than. I hate to say this, but it's true. I mean, we have to face up to the truth. This recycle, try to recycle everything possible approach with the current materials we have is is a loser. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to be strategic in what we recycle and what how, what we define as recyclable. Um, and and that kind of life cycle analysis, Oregon has really led the way on that now. But we need more of that so that we can really invest in the right technology for the kind of waste we have to deal with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I can interject, we had a question come in the Q&A box um, to expand on the, the four R's that you mentioned that come before recycling. I think a lot of us learned the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, but if you could expand on, on the other two, that'd be helpful for folks. So which were the other two? I'm sorry, were we, oh, oh ref, refuse and redesign was it or, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, okay, the well, question that came in from Ellen was, can you expand on those first four R's that come before recycle? Yeah, yes. Well, uh, you know, what we re reuse obviously um, is uh, something that we're getting better at actually in, in a lot of ways, um, the thrift, the thrifting, uh, economy and the second use economy uh, has has been expanding and embraced by by um, larger segments of the population, particularly uh, 
young people are like thrifting is like a sport and a, <laughs> and a social media sensation for them. Uh, so find you know the best thing we can do is find second life for products or to buy things that are used. I haven't bought a new electronic uh, item in years. I use them in my job and my work all the time. Computers, and monitors. I only look for things that have been used or are re reconditioned. Um, I, I don't I don't have have the kind of work where I need bleeding edge tech. I just need stuff that works. Um, so it's both economical and it's it's less of an impact. I think thinking about that for uh, you know, for all things uh, is is something we can all do to to reuse. But then there's the more subtle reuse. You know, I mean, we still have a struggle with the amount of of disposable coffee cups we consume. <laughs> I I, I want to say it's like fifty billion a year, and uh, I'm taking this out of thin air, but that's the number I remember in in this country alone for you know Starbucks type cups that are aren't uh, easy and often recycled. Um, how hard it is is to you know use the reusable cup option and, and and make choices like that on a on a daily basis. Make your own damn coffee; it, it's so much cheaper and better, you know, than that burnt tasting stuff they sell. Sorry, I, I just I think we've gotten to this habit of of seeing convenience in in these daily choices, uh, whereas it's really not any less convenient to make a choice that be dealing with kind of reusable product instead and and do that a little bit of time and you know then you really are feeling a little virtuous about uh about rather than just hoping when you throw something in the recycling thing and then the other thing redesign is you know that's really the heart of that's why i'm so excited about the, the epr in, in maine and uh, other states because it encourages rethinking how we make these uh products these containers and packaging in the first place um, and and the ball was already moving in that direction a little bit, and and, and of all uh, entities to, to single out for sort of pushing it that way, it was it was Walmart sustainability initiative that began this crusade of trying to reduce packaging, and it was it was totally total self interest because they could fit more stuff on the truck and more stuff on the shelf, and it was cheaper to ship than you make things that are, are are smaller and and less weighty, and and now not just reducing size, but now this idea that we could encourage the selection of materials that are more fully recycling. Somebody asked in the chat about uh, the number five class, that's the what, yogurt container type uh, plastics that uh, there's very little value in recycling as it can be done, but it's hard to find a market for the material. So uh, encouraging a reformulation of, of and packaging for that product from the top down that's part of the redesign, but then there's also redesigning our own choices. Like I'm, uh, I'm looking at joining a local food co-op co that really emphasizes not having that kind of packaging for many of the uh, food products are, are sold there. So it's the choices for avoiding those kinds of plastic containers are also expanding for us now. And uh, um, so that's a form of redesign, also a redesign by choice. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Well, any more r's i need to cover there i think those are the two big yeah. like lesser known r's but, oh refuse just don't you know refusing is another kind of redesigning our lives you know just re if we if the market shrinks for those kinds of products because we're refusing them you know uh then things change because of that pressure as well mm -hmm. no completely i have a couple um things you always make me think about other things uh, um i uh, I do what you're doing with electronics. I try to do with my clothing. Um, this is my yeah. my sustainability. I I love buying dresses. I can't help it, and I'm wearing one now. But I try to buy used clothes as, um, all the time. I try. Yeah, there's no reason for me to be. Tommy Bahama, eighteen bucks. Nice. Yes, exactly. <laughs> we get cooler things, and um, um, you know, the impact of our uh, like fashion and clothing industry is just a whole nother webinar in itself. Um. And um, with the, you know, <clears throat> to me, like switching out the packaging and, um, you know, getting the reusable coffee mugs, to me, that's still really the low hanging fruit. Like we banned the plastic bags and the styrofoam containers here in Maine, because those are just like 
We do not have them for those purposes whatsoever. So those are gone. So I think the next like step of low hanging fruit is really our um, foodware coffee cups. There's no reason we need to be just having stacks and stacks of disposable cups going and going and going. It's something people do every day. They go back to the same coffee shops. Um, same thing with all of the, you know, any food, any takeout foodware um, to me is just like the next thing to go. And instead of swapping out those, you know, putting in the effort to swap out those um, single use materials with other single use materials, we need to just swap them out for their reusable alternatives and set up the systems in a way so that it's just easy for people to use. Right now, it's a little bit only diehards like all of us on here are they're doing that maybe. Um, but we need to make it simple for just everybody to use so that they don't have to even think about it. Absolutely. That's where policy comes in. <laughs> yes, yeah, so there was a question what the uh, five R's are. Well, I, I sort of just made up some of those, but uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, reduce, reuse, refuse, redesign, recycle. Those were the, and then, um, but repurpose works too. So maybe we should have six R's, so. Yeah. Maybe we can think of some more. Let's change the world with uh, yeah, as many hours as we can think of. So. We had another question come in a few times from Susan um, asking about fabric and mattress recycling. I guess Massachusetts has a program to do so. Is that something Maine is considering or other states that we could look into? I can. That talk. was that was something that was on the table up in um, San Francisco when I was working on the first doing the research for uh, the first garbology, you know. Eight, eight years ago um i don't know if they've adopted it yet but that's that, that's a real disposal disposal challenge and um uh having an epr for that makes perfect sense uh, because of the material choices that'll dry yeah i uh, do you think sarah well so i've been at nrcm for will be almost nine years anyway um it's crazy but um i've been talking about mattress recycling during that entire time um, <laughs> and um, other states I can't list them off the top of my head right now do have EPR for mattress recycling and mattress collection um, getting it to come to Maine um, has proven to be a challenge mostly because of our population density and the distance to a facility where these mattresses need to go and um, or if they stay here the the um, just the cost of, of dismantling them and the time it takes uh, here. Some places, some transfer stations are doing it and there's some movement here. And the mattress industry is in favor of some of these types of policies elsewhere. But to get that same type of policy here, the upfront consumer charge that they would have to place on it, it was, it's too much for, to, it's just too it's prohibitive um, for the policy. So I'm sure it'll, it's a continuing problem at some point. We'll, figure it out here, I'm hopeful for. Um, and then as far as the uh, clothing and um, other textiles, um, that's a huge mountain that I'm not prepared to talk about right now, but uh, things need to happen there for sure. Um, let's see, Kristen, what other questions are you seeing? We've had a lot of comments come in, comments come in on refill stores and being able to do bulk refill. Um, so Jill was asking if we see any traction on more refill stores coming in. Um, someone in the chat said something about how um, they haven't been able to bring their own containers to refill stores because of uh, possible regulations from the FDA. So are there thoughts on Let's just talk about refill stores in general. Do we think we'll have more? Are you allowed to bring your own containers or does that depend by store? Is that a good solution to our waste problem? Well, I think uh, there's been some, the pandemic has kind of hurt, hurt us on a lot of uh, choices like that. Um, you know, everything from the salad bar to, you know, the uh, um, refill stores and, and zero waste stores. But yeah, I think, I think we were seeing a pre-pandemic trend where those options were expanding and people were, were, were liking liking having that option. But right now it's still pretty niche, don't you think so? Um, yes, I mean, with the circles I run, people have always, yeah. So I'm like in my own echo chamber, people have always wanted that. Um, we have a really amazing store in South Portland called Go Go Refill. That's my local store that I go to, I don't know. Um, if Laura is on the on, on this today, um, and she let's see, we film that. Okay, um, and um, 
we at NRCM um, with uh, Vanessa Berry, she's our outreach coordinator for the Sustainable Maine team now. Um, we're transitioning to put a, a new map on our website of all of the places in Maine where they welcome refill and reduce. Um, and that'll be up soon. The that match will be launched, not launched soon on the website, um, which is great. So people from all over the state can look and see where they can do that. And also oh, that's great. as far as, um, you know, the people are confused on what the right thing to do is. And Maine has taken a lot of steps um, recently to provide clear guidance to stores and people about what is safe and what is okay. It is perfectly legal and safe to bring your containers <laughs> to restaurants and to grocery stores. And they've released the guidance saying such, um, but I think there's still a lot of fear going around it. So there's more work to do um, to help businesses um, understand that and, and consumers too and push that culture and I think we're in a place in Maine we're just thrifty by nature and we don't like to waste it's just part of our culture here um I think we're a prime place to 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 do that yeah speaking of being thrifty by nature Dennis put a great great point in the Q&A box that um another part of the reuse issue is the right to repair approach mm. um do either mm. of your thoughts on on, on right to repair, or how we can implement that here in Maine? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, it's so frustrating um, not having that option when you when you have a product that fails and have to replace it instead of uh, uh, getting it fixed. And um, I, I, I think I read that Maine has a really active sort of grassroots kind of, uh, you know, almost like a book club for uh, for uh, repair uh, 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 practitioners and and and, and customers uh, am I wrong or that it seems like a very mean kind of thing to yeah, yeah I think they're um, repair cafes they're called yes that's the term I was looking for yes um, where people yeah really handy people can go and set up shop and you can bring in things for them to fix um, I think my dad would gladly go there um, he loves fixing things um, I um, regrettably can't pull any out of my head right now, but that, um, that has been happening some here. And as far as the right to repair legislation, um, that has been brought forward here in Maine. It hasn't um, gained a lot of traction. I'd like to see that happening here. I'll, I'll certainly um, uh, take a look and talk to the people who were bringing this forward before. But um, yeah, there's right to, there's a, if you Google it too, there's, I know there's a whole website dedicated to this and there's laws popping up all over the place. It's just yeah. um, for people who don't know right to repair is, I don't know, I'm just assuming that they did, I guess. It's just, um, yeah, that um, the manufacturers of these products have to release guidance um, or instructions on how you can, you can fix your products so you don't have to throw it out and buy a new one. Um, Cause otherwise they want you to throw it out and buy a new one <laughs> because that benefits them more. And I think that there's more regulation around the auto industry on that. And it's basically expanding that um, concept to um, everything else. Right. Yeah, Vanessa just dropped in the chat a few um, comments ago that we have a Google form where you can put recommendations for businesses who allow refills. Um, so if folks in the audience have suggestions of places you go or love, um, please drop them there and they'll be included on, on the map that we're pulling together. Um, one topic we haven't gotten to yet that I think we were interested in talking about is the difference between personal responsibility in reducing waste and corporate accountability. Um, I'd love to hear the two of you talk a little bit more about, about the difference in those two approaches and, and which is the right one to pursue or which one can make a bigger difference. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not an either or, is it? I mean, <laughs> I think uh, we need, uh, we need uh, uh, great big health things of both. Uh, you know, and it's not, it's hard to say which one is the tougher nut to crack because we are creatures of habit and we have a lot of really uh, things that uh, from a historical process, uh, pr perspective, it's just an un un unprecedented way to live, to have all this stuff we throw away all the time. And just, it's only in, in very recent history that that's become normal. and. I think a few generations back, uh, people would just be horrified at at how much how much we throw away, uh, including you know food and it costs all amounts of food that we waste and all the energy and effort that goes into creating that food and then as much as forty percent ends up you know 
not eaten. <laughs> Same with our energy system, where we you know, waste about 60% of that. It's unprecedented to have a society that can sustain the levels of waste that we consider to be normal. So how do we get, when something is normalized, it's very hard to, to see a diff, have different choices that, that seem to make sense or even possible for us. So the personal responsibility no matter how well-meaning a person is, it's really hard for them to imagine doing some basic things differently that um, we uh, kind of need to do. Um, in some ways, getting corporate responsibility is, is is more straightforward. You can't really have an EPR for personal responsibility, can you? But there's a model for for getting um, doing it from the top down and, and figuring out how to also make it a grassroots movement to you know one of the storylines i'm looking at uh, and it, and it, it's also ending a wasteful product uh, process and replacing it with uh, an efficient one it's the movement in so many uh, areas to have electrification over uh, natural gas in new construction um, because the, the 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 energy efficiency of the one is an order of magnitude greater than uh than the other cooking on a gas stove was you know we're cooking with gas i mean it's actually a part of the culture that it's a good thing thing you know it means it's a metaphor for things are going great um in fact homes with gas stoves have 40 percent higher incidence of childhood asthma and respiratory ailments it's great data on this now literally it's it's, it's the single best thing you can do if you have an asthmatic child to rip out your gas stove um connecting that kind of Ad advantage to the more sustainable alternative of, of electrification over gas is how you, I think, drive the personal responsibility choices. It has to be more than just saving the planet. It has to be, I'm making my kids sick every time we make Thanksgiving dinner. We got to do it a different way. That is going to change hearts and minds in, a, in, in much more quickly. And um, I think we, uh, whenever people do what I do, what uh, uh, what what this, <laughs> I, I keep wanting to say NRCM and our NCRM. I keep getting into it, but that's what I'm stumbling over. What you guys do uh, is when we can make that connection for people, um, it, it's really helpful because we're you know we're helping them see see things in a new way and make uh, a different choice that's going to make them happier and healthier and, and also help the planet. I, I think we need to to find those stories to to drive this kind of change from the grassroots up. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'll start by saying I, I exactly what Ed said is that it's all of it, all of the above. We need all of it. <laughs> um, but to me, I'm really sensitive to um, the manufactured demand or the, you know, the manufacturing of our culture by corporations to suit their own profit. So um, like we do, you know, we control our culture and what we do in our own homes a certain way, but just to be cognizant of the influence that these corporations have on our culture, even, you know, manufacturing demand for bottled water, like another story of stuff. I see somebody put a link in there. If you go watch that one, it is just, it's really upsetting to see how they've manipulated people into thinking that they absolutely need to buy bottled water all the time for all these things. You know, um, and that's just to, so there's just one example or of, um, you know, BP um, was the one who created the carbon footprint calculator, your personal carbon footprint calculator so that they could don't pay attention to the man behind the curtain. Look at what you are doing and your choices and your things. So that's the part I'm super duper sensitive about because, well, they're, you know, the, that stuff that's happening behind the scenes. And I don't think that they should do that. And I'm also as a, as a lobbyist in Augusta, I am just appalled at the amount of influence that um, and money that these corporations throw at lobbyists to influence lawmakers and people general you know people like us don't have as much yeah say there so um thank goodness for nrcm and organizations like ours that are up there um you know i say you know lobbyists for the environment um and um yeah and one more thing that i thought of too is the as far as <clears throat> epr and goes, I, I can't see how we apply that to food. <laughs> that has to be a different cultural change and expectations, which has to do with a lot more about skills and time and how we plan and 
everything that has to do with food, but that's not something I think we need to put back on the, the food producers. So um, to me, that's a separate waste stream with different um, different issues. And we can- Oh boy, we finally have something we don't quite agree with because, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because there's the, 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 you know, right now, one of our, I mean, climate change is, is essentially a problem of waste in, in a different form. It's not what we throw in the trash can. Well, part of it is, but it's 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 how we do things. Mm-hmm. And one of our biggest drivers of of global warming right now is how we create our food, how we raise uh, our crops and our livestock. And there's there's a very robust movement mm-hmm. and a lot of work being done on how do we invest in the type of agriculture that both is more productive but also uh, more climate friendly. Um, so yeah, there's a there's a uh, lot that can that. be done, and our policy, our national policies, can really encourage yeah. encourage that. So that I think there can be something like an EPR for uh, uh, for how we how we farm, and that it would mm-hmm. have reap incredible benefits over over the you know sort of you know factory farming. It's like the rape and pillage uh, approach to. Uh, to, to making food now and and, yeah, and maine is a hotbed for the alternative to that actually there's a lot of cool things happening in maine on that score so i i think we can have policies on that oh. that are very similar yeah no, to, to an epr yeah. no i'm um uh, i do agree with you on that issue just to be clear but the um yeah i wonder if it's more a different type of policy where it's, you aren't allowed to do that <laughs> not we'd want to encourage you not to do it it's like you're not allowed to do it yeah yeah <laughs> yeah that well, i would like it better uh well, anyway i want to be respectful of people i want to be respectful of people's time and we are coming up on one o'clock we had one last question that i think will lead us well into our um call to action that came in when someone registered and they asked did we and i'm assuming that's the royal we meaning nrcm and our supporters and our partners um, really stop out-of-state trash from coming into Maine. And so, Sarah, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about our victory um, and how NRCM and our supporters were involved in doing that. Okay, I'll try to do that as quickly as possible. Um, <laughs> um, in general, um, waste is um, part of commerce, and we have a federal commerce clause saying you can't you know, prevent that from going in between state lines. So we can't prevent all waste from coming into Maine. It's just impossible. But what we did do was... Um, Our state-owned landfills, um, the state bought them um, for the express purpose of being able to control what goes into them. If they were commercial landfill, then they fall under that Commerce Clause issue. But the state bought it for that purpose. There was a loophole that allowed out-of-state waste to still enter our landfill at a really alarming growing rate. There was about a third of the waste um, there was from um, construction demolition debris from Massachusetts. And what we did recently, we, as in our members and supporters and all the people and the lawmakers, Uh, close that loophole. So Massachusetts is not going to be able to um, funnel all their construction debris into Maine's um, state-owned landfill anymore. And that took a ton of support from from Sarah and from our staff, Chrissy, who is here, our partners in the Environmental Priorities Coalition, and a ton of input from folks like all of you who signed petitions, wrote your lawmakers, called your lawmakers, showed up at the state house. Um, so that kind of effort on these policies really makes a difference in getting them passed. Mm-hmm. I'm going to put two links in the chat. One is to sign up for our action network if you aren't already. We send out emails there about ways you can weigh in on bills and when it's most important. And then our take action toolkit, which has tips on tracking bills that we're following and um, weighing in at public hearings and other things. Um, but we are past one o'clock. Oh, Sarah, you have one last thing to say. One quick thing. Um, if you could put the link in there, Kristen, I was trying to find it for NRCM's public um, um, People's Choice Awards. Don't Waste Maine. Um, we have a lot of amazing um, nominees for that, but Don't Waste Maine was the group who um, was integral in um, supporting the out-of-state waste law, and they're nominated, and um, uh I would really like them to win. So if everybody watching could go on and um, vote for Don't Waste Me, I would uh, appreciate it. I'm just putting a link into my website too, into the chat if anybody uh, wants to uh, visit my website and learn a little bit more about my uh, book and, and work, I would welcome that. Yeah, Ed, when can we expect Garbology, the sequel to come out? Uh, or is that putting you next on the year spot? Some, next year sometime i'm hoping <laughs> um i have another i have a totally different kind of book coming out in november so um it's funny there is trash that's figure into it but it's a crime trashing crime kind of thing so. 
Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Ed. And yes, please do check out Ed's work. Again, he has written 16 books. So if you're looking for some reading material, I certainly bet you can find something that will interest you on that list. Find um, it in a used bookstore, by all means, though. There you go. <laughs> that reused, too. Um, um, all right. Thank you both. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Have a great rest of your Thursday. Thank you. Thank you.